All right. <laughs> As I told you last week, we have a uh, guest speaker today from Israel Palestine, and uh, uh, they are a grassroots organization or uh, so, so, you know a civil society kind of activist to promote and create a bridge between different cultures and different religion. And uh, his parents devoted land, uh, a farm that can be uh, used as a site, you know, uh, for different workshops and also as a site for both local and international students to come and, and visit and reflect and talk and understand the nature and the background of the conflict uh, in the region. As you know, it's a very, very difficult region. It has history of conflict for many, many years. This is a chapter we are going to cover uh, uh, this week. So Mr. Nasser will give us a brief description of the background of the conflict, Israeli-Palestine conflict, or on a larger scale, the Arab-Israel conflict, the issue of land, the issue of religion, the nature of the violence, and what can be done, and what they have they are doing. I mean, I mean, peace is central to uh, human endeavor, and uh, that's what we also promote as as a community in Gustavus. Uh, the best way to resolve people's difference, religious, historical, ethnic difference is by coming together. Otherwise, it will lead us to the process of eliminating one another, that's not peace. Peace is trying to find uh, a middle way, a common you know, uh, 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 point where we can uh, give and take and live in diversity, accommodate one another. As I said, the more diverse we are, the more beautiful we look like a flower. If a flower is one color, nobody will go to shop to buy it. The fact that we are obsessed with a flower as a gift, as a symbol of love, is because the diverse nature of that flower. So I very much uh, I'm interested in what they do on grassroots lava, also difficult it is. And we'll uh, hear from Mr. Nasser. So now we'll take the recording. Thank you so well, much. much. Welcome. Very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, having us today uh, in this class. Um, of course, um, we won't be able to solve the conflict uh, in this class, but of course I'll try to give you an idea about what is happening there. And I will speak about the, um, the development. I mean, I won't uh, go into details, and I hope you will cover that in the class. But at the end, take one example uh, about the family, uh, example of struggling to keep the land. And, uh, and the last part of the, of the talk will be uh, what can be done in a difficult situation. So uh, just to my, you know, my name is Dawood, and Dawood is David, and uh, was born in Bethlehem. And I'm a Palestinian, and my religion is Christian, Palestinian Christian. And I grew up uh, uh, there, um, uh, studied in Austria, studied theology in the Bible School in Austria, studied at Bethlehem University uh, business and continued with tourism management. And I was, was dealing with the you know, tourism issues in that country because you know, many tourists are coming to visit the area. But the most important thing is not just to visit the places, the holy historical places. And of course, the Holy Land is holy for the three religions, for Judaism, for Christianity, and for Islam. And at the end, Many people, they come and go without, uh, you know, interfere with people, without talking to the people there, without talking to Israelis and Palestinians, without meeting Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And at the end, they go back home without knowing what's happening there. So um, I will just give you a brief introduction about the, um, the area there. And as, as we see here, oops. Yeah, this is the the the, um, the map of Palestine. Of course, the Palestine was was under the under the um, Ottoman 
Empire for more than 400 years until 1916. And then from 1917 until 1947, the country was you know, under the British mandate control. And of course, you know, the, the conflict started, I mean, it started years back, but uh, was like um, going faster um, early in the, in the last century. When, uh, when Jewish started to immigrate to Palestine. And as you see here, before 1948, the majority of the population were in the country were Palestinians. And then, you know, like in 1947, when the British left and the UN took over, they started to say, well, why not to solve this conflict and have two states on that area where the, the, the Palestinians could get their state, and the Jews, the Israelis could get their state. So this was the plan to do that, to divide the historic Palestine, the country, into two states, with Jerusalem, as you see here, Jerusalem to be like an open city, international city, controlled by the UN, because this is, let us say, the city that, uh, the center of the three religions. But of course, this plan did not work. And with 1948, the establishing of the State of Israel, and of course, on the other side, the Palestinians call it the catastrophe, because this situation left more than 750,000 Palestinians without a home. They had to leave their country, and they are living in refugee camps in, in the West Bank and in Gaza, and also in the Arab countries. From 1947, 48, until 1967, this was the West Bank was under the Jordanian rule, and the Gaza under the Egyptian rule. And then with the Six Day War, 1967, um, yeah, the Israelis control now the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. And since then, we are living, I mean, Palestinians, they're living under occupation. Now, of course, the Israelis started to build settlements in the West Bank. And day by day, the land was being cut and cut. So nowadays, we are not in charge of everything. We are in charge just in some places in the West Bank as Palestinians. Now, you know, in 1991, the peace process started. And of course, like you can, uh, you know, you can learn more about it later, you know. But just to give you a brief introduction, so with the peace process, the, what is called the West Bank was divided into three zones, three areas, and which is the majority of the area, which is this color, is under Israeli control. That means the Palestinians in this area control just people. They, don't, they are not controlling land, they are not controlling resources, and they are not controlling borders. So it's very difficult to talk about independence in a small area of land, and at the same time, without in charge of land, resources, and borders. Now, this is the, the, the context in, in our area. And of course, when you talk about land issues, you, know, you talk about like there is no future if a population has no land. Now, um, I will come to the, to the story of, um, of my family. <coughs> my grandfather, in 1916, during the Ottoman period, he bought the land southwest of Bethlehem, located on a hill. And of course, now it is surrounded by uh, five Israeli Jewish settlements. And my grandfather was a farmer. He used to, to, uh, to make wine. So he bought this piece of land. And they planted more than 25,000 grape trees. And they started producing wine. And of course, this is um, the, the most important thing my grandfather did at that time. And of course, you see people adapted always the, the new culture. You know, So Palestine was always occupied. The Romans were there. The Byzantines were there. The Muslims were there. You know, always you know, people in that country, the native people in that country, they started to adopt the new culture. And this is exactly the dresses during the Ottoman period. And when the British came, we st the people started to, to, you know, to wear ties. You know? so, uh, but this is not our subject today. Um, 
when my grandfather bought the land, he registered it. And it was unusual at that time, because papers were not important, according to the, to the tradition there. And this is the biblical tradition. People could buy mountains with handshakes. So why do you need papers and signatures and so on? No? But my grandfather did it the right way, so he registered the land. So we got documents from the Ottomans. And then my father and uncle continued re-registering the land during the British mandate, during uh, the Jordanians, and after the Israelis in 1967. And we have also documents that, that uh, you know, proved we paid taxes at that time, property taxes. And the second unusual thing my grandfather did which, um, you know, like according to our traditions, people were not living on their farms. So you don't see people living on the farms. They live in communities, like a village or a city, and they walk to their land and come back in the evening. But my grandfather did it the other way because he wanted his children to grow up with the land. And this is exactly what happened. So after my grandparents died, my father and uncle continued their work. They continued farming the land living in caves until they passed away. In 1991, this is the piece of land I'm talking about, and now it's surrounded by settlements. In 1991, the Israeli authorities declared the farm as, a, as state land in order to confiscate the land and build a settlement on it. And their argument was the land has no owner. So since we have documents from 1916, we started, you know, we went on a legal battle with the Israelis in order to prevent our land from being confiscated. And of course, it is a, um, a military court. So we started the process in 1991, and it is going on and on until today. So we are um, uh, in, in the front of the military court for 12 years, and in the Supreme Court for 11 years now. So altogether, almost 23 years of legal battle, military and supreme, with a financial burden of more than $170,000. And you know you are in an unjust situation because you have the documents, you have your presence, but still there is no justice. But at the end, we are not giving up. We believe that one day justice will prevail, although the system is unjust for us. So. Um, we, uh, we are continuing the legal battle, but at the same time, you know, there are um, groups in the Israeli settlements who are uh, radical groups that come with the, with the um, ideology, God promises the land. So those kinds of people, they came to a farm, they cut our trees, it's like since 1991, we are facing those difficulties. They um, damaged our water tank, they threatened us with guns, and they tried just on their own to build roads. They start to come with, with big diggers and bulldozers to build a road and to establish a settlement. And of course, we went all the way legally. And the last time, it was in 2002, when they started constructing the road, we managed to, to stop it legally uh, in 2001 uh, through going to the Israeli courts and the settlers we're very frustrated because we stopped them from building the road on our own land, and they damaged 250 olive trees from our property. And of course, like an olive tree is a symbol of hope and peace. So we, uh, we were very sad because in our country, when you plant a tree, it's not easy to grow. You have to take care of it. It's a dry climate. But later on, three weeks later, we managed to plant new trees and sponsored by a Jewish organization from the UK called European Jews for Just Peace in Palestine. They heard about our situation, and they sponsored 250 olive trees, and they came and planted them. So we realized, like, with this kind of example, that there are people who believe and act for justice. You know? yeah. And this is, was, for us, a the very positive encounter. Now, um, the journey of violence continued. Like on the 30th of March, we found a piece of paper on the eastern side of the farm, which says the area where we planted here 10 years ago, around 1,500 
grape, apple, and apricot trees. They said, well, those trees were planted on state land. Yeah? That means it's not your private property. So immediately after we found this document, we appealed, because this is our strategy to go legally all the way. And we appealed, and our appeal was accepted by the military court, because we have the papers. We have the documents. And we were waiting to have um, a court a court, a court case, you know. But instead of um, waiting for a court decision, the, the army came with bulldozers, and they damaged all the trees. And they uh, buried the trees into the ground. So this was like uh, a punishment for the trees. So uh, we lost about 1,500 trees. And the problem is the, the, the story is like a, it's a very sad story, because we were watching the trees to grow up, to grow and grow like our own kid children. Uh, but uh, with, uh, you know, like, uh, with sadness and uh, frustration, we started rebuilding the terraces. And we are preparing the land to be planted again. And now we have committed people who would like to come and plant trees. Among them is American Jewish group who's coming in the middle of February to plant, to replant the trees that was destroyed. So um, on the legal issues, we started a legal battle because this, this action was done illegal according to the court, according to the law. So we have two court cases going on now to, um, you know, like, um, and the question is, why did they destroy the trees, although the trees were planted on the private property? One tree, of course, uh, the, the damages happened just a week before the harvest. And we were expect, expecting a very good harvest. One tree did, was not destroyed, which is the fig tree. And that's why we call it now the, the, the steadfast witness, the tree that witnessed what happened. and. We hope, you know, as, as as to reconcile with the land, to to uh, to reconcile of what happened. I mean, because for us, it's like we did everything, but we could not prevent the destruction of our trees. And that's why it's important now to replant, to rebuild, and to replant. And that's why we hope that this fig tree will also witness the uh, the new cultivation and the new plantation of this area. Now, of course, um, with, with violence, we, we did not give up. You know, we are still there. And we, are, we did not give up. We did not lose any, any of the land. Now, we have a problem there, which is the war that is being built to separate people from each other. Of course, we have two problems with the war. The wall is, with wall, we cannot achieve peace. With walls, you achieve more um, hatred. You know, when you separate people from each other, it's, it's there is no peace with that. And the second problem with the wall in our area is that the wall is being built not at the borders between the West Bank and Israel. It is going through the Palestinian ter territories and is separating people from their land. And this is the case with our family farm. It's located here. And this is the border, the green line, the border between Israel and the West Bank. And this is the route of the war. So the people will be living in an enclave, totally disconnected from the, the city, which is about six miles away. And this situation will force many people to give up and leave, because they will be totally disconnected. They cannot go to their work easily. The only access will be a road here, and this will make it difficult for people to exist and to continue farming their land. Now, of course, with, with, when <coughs> people live under, like, um, a, in a conflict situation, um, usually they respond with three ways. Uh, they respond, the first way, would they respond with violence. When people live in violence, they say, well, I'm pushed to the corner. What should I do? You know, so the normal reaction is to respond with violence. But the question is, what 
can people achieve with violence except more violence. You know, with violence, we create more bitterness, more hatred. You know, uh, we, we build more walls physically and psychologically between nations and between people. And so for us, we said violence is never a solution. We put it on the side. The normal, the, the, the second normal reaction is to sit down and cry and accept the situation as it is. You say, well, I can't do it. I can't handle it. Let me wait for something to happen, you know, for a miracle to happen. It might happen, but it might take longer, and it might never happen. So this is also not a response for us, because you know, like being, like to resign is like being a victim. And it's, um, it's very bad to fall in the victimhood. Um, and then the third option is to give up and leave. And who is leaving? The best educated people. And uh, you know, like maybe you can copy this to our to your situation. Of course, like I mean, everyone in life faces uh, struggles or crises or difficulties. Sometimes we react violently towards our problems. We try to, you know, like uh, to prove ourselves. I can do it. Can you know? But it's not the solution. Sometimes you accept the situation as it is and say, you know, I cannot handle it and be a victim. And it is dangerous to fall in the victimhood because at the end, sometimes we are blaming others for our own mistakes. And thirdly, or you can decide to run away from your own problems. In our case, we said none of those options is good. So we, we, um, we are not uh, acting violently, we are not resigning, and we are not giving up and leaving. So <clears throat> we started to think about a different way of resistance. And we said four important things here. Before, because we said if you, if you want to start something new, we have to think, we have to work on ourselves. You know? We cannot try to change other people if we are not changing ourselves. I cannot make peace if I'm not peaceful. And I cannot make friends if I'm not friendly. And I cannot expect others to be friendly with me and I'm not friendly. So I have to work on myself. And that's why it was important for us to say four things that was, that was the start of a new beginning. And that's why we said from the beginning, we refuse to be victims. We need to be out of the victim. Although the situation is bad, and I can tell you hundreds of stories how difficult life is, but we definitely, we refuse to be victims. And then the second issue we said, we refuse to hate. And of course it's easy said difficult to live. How can, how can you don't hate the people who are hating you? you know? So it's, it's a difficult thing, but for us it's important to say, we want to distinguish between hating the other and not accepting their bad actions. So people should respect each other as humans. But when people does do mistakes, you know, I have my neighbor or, you know, sorry, you are doing something wrong. I have to stand up for my rights. And the third thing we said, we are we will act in a different way, not because we are good people, but because this is part of our beliefs. We want we are believing in this way of Nonviolent resistance. And fourthly, we said we are people who believe in justice. And of course, the path of justice is long and uh, too difficult. But at the end, justice will prevail. So after we said that, we created another way, a new way, a positive, a constructive way of resistance by overcoming, overcoming evil, not with more evil, but with good. Hatred with love and darkness with light, under the slogan, the title, we refuse to be enemies. I am not an enemy. I am refusing to be put in that circle. And we started with this way of resistance, which is a positive, creative, and, and a constructive way, a project on the farm called the Tent of Nations. And we say the Tent of Nations people building bridges, because we need people to build bridges of understanding, of reconciliation and peace. 
And uh, with the Tent of Nations, um, it is a therapy for us. Because in a situation like that, it's very easy for people to get frustrated and to act in a violent way. But for us, with what we are, what we are doing there is like we are trying to invest our frustration in a constructive way. Because our frustration is a negative energy. When we are frustrated, we are angry, and when we are angry, we act negatively. But we try to channel this negative energy, this frustration, to be invested constructively. And secondly, it's, it's difficult but doable. Secondly, we are committed to nonviolent resistance. That's why we are going all the way in the courts, although the system is unjust for us. And thirdly, we said, let's open the farm for people to come and see. And so we, op we are opening this place for people, locals, internationals, Israeli people, to come and see, to connect the situation with faces. And when you start to, to, to make a face to what you call an enemy, you know, you start to raise questions. And this is important for us, building a bridge of understanding, like solving solving, um, um, let us say, conflict, you cannot solve it just on paper. You know? People, they, st they have to start to change their image about the other. And you cannot do that without creating an understanding, without bringing a face to the story. And um, thirdly, we said, you know, we, um, and the fourth issue, we said, we want to connect people with land because, you know, all over, we have environmental problems. In our, in our area there, environment is not a theme at school. So that's why it's important to connect people with land, plant trees, protect the environment, and keep a healthy society for the new generation. Now, um, on the spot here, and of course with all restrictions that the road is blocked, we have more restrictions there. On the ground there, we are not allowed to have running water, no electricity and no building permit because those we are restricted there. And the question is, how can we develop the farm without electricity, water, and building permits? So we started to think about creative ideas. So for electricity, what do you think? What did we do for electricity? Solar panels. Solar panels, exactly. We have solar panels now since since uh, 2009 and. With that, we, we are totally independent in terms of energy. We have 25 batteries, and we um, you know, charge the batteries for the evening. And now we can even there run uh, electrical machines. And by doing that, we managed to save more than 45,000 US dollars for fuel expenses we used to run a diesel generator. So by doing that, it's not about electricity, it's about telling other people, showing other people that things are possible, even in a difficult situation. So don't sit down, don't cry, and don't blame the other. Stand up and act in a different way. And of course, by doing that, we motivated ourselves, and we, we are like um, um, encouraged other people to do so, and at the same time, we are protecting the environment. So positive actions, are not helpful just on the ground, are helpful to, to keep ourselves motivated, to motivate others, and also the, for the benefit of the environment. Now with water, what, how we solved the issue of water? We started collecting rainwater into systems. You know, rainwater doesn't drain that much, but uh, we try to collect as much as we can, and then we pump the water up on the roof and use it for uh, for um, cleaning, for even for drinking, because we filter it and use it for drinking. And this is like systems, like we collect rainwater into the systems. So we cement it like a, like a water reservoir, and uh, we use the water during the summertime. Um, with buildings, we are not allowed to build on the ground. We started building under the ground. We started renovating existing caves. You know, it's a way of non-violent resistance in a positive way. And now we, uh, we extended some uh, caves. Um, we have this, this is a chapel cave, like we, we use it as a prayer room. And one time we had in this room like a prayer for peace where Jews, where Christians and Muslims came together 
and prayed for peace in this chapel. And for us, it is a way, like you know, as you see here, like breaking the gun, it's a nonviolent way of resistance. Um, and of course, we started, of course, renovating caves and extending it to small houses for, a, for the volunteers, a workshop for uh, our uh, tools and machineries. This is our meeting room there, which was a cave, natural cave for horses. And now it's a nice meeting room. And the paintings is done by children during one of our summer camp. And the title was Peace, Justice, and Conservation of the Creation. The children painted their shadow. So it is a way to encourage people. Of course, we continue to think about creative ideas. So now we are filtering the gray water to be used for irrigation. Like, and um, we are using compost toilets also, and because to save water. And the idea is like to produce biogas out of the compost. So any new idea, if you have any crazy creative idea, you are welcome also to share it with us. And uh, th those compost toilets were built by an Israeli. When he came to visit the farm, it changes his idea, it changes you know, his um, like thinking. And he decided to uh, join a peace, uh, peace group inside Israel. And he came back and he said, Lieutenant, how can I help you? What can I do? And this is important to say, when people start to see the other as human being, things are changing. You know, we are on the right track for peace. The first, that's why when we call, if we want to achieve peace, we have to create an understanding first. You cannot have peace through handshake. No, we have to create an understanding to understand what's going on, and then walk on the process of reconciliation before coming to the uh, end goal, which is peace. Now, um, of course, we have infrastructure there. We have, in, we have can, uh, tents to accommodate our guests and volunteers. We are um, started to do different kinds of activities to bring people together. And every year, we do a tree planting uh, project. We invite internationals, Palestinians, Israelis to come and plant a tree for peace. Because for us, when we plant a tree, we believe in the future. And we believe that this tree is going to bear fruits, and especially an olive tree, which it's like, you know, we plant a tree one year old, and the hope is in 20 years to become like this. It's, it's a slow growing tree because of, uh, of lack of water. But the first olives might come after 10 years. So we have to take care of the tree the first 10 years in order to start the, few, the first few olives. But the best fruits of olives might come after 20 years or 30 years. So, uh, but for us, when we plant a tree, we protect the ground, we protect the land, and we make the land, uh, of course, like um, um, a symbol of hope and peace. But also, we learn that if we are talking about peace, we should start from the bottom and up. We should start from the ground. Because you cannot build a house on sand. You need the foundation. Uh, and you start from the bottom, and the tree grows slowly, slowly. The second project we are doing is children's summer camp activities. We invite children, and we work with them, traumatized children, difficult situation. But we have a theme every camp. So the last summer camp theme was with heart and hand. We changed that. You know, we need the people to believe. We need the children to think in a positive way. We need them to, uh, to discover their talents, focus on the positive, not just deal with their problems and difficulties and believe in themselves, I am able to make a difference. So remember, the, uh, the summer camps are in July, the last two weeks of July. So if you have a summer holiday and you don't know what to do, and you want to do something um, constructive, you know, join us on working with children. I mean, you know, we are not asking uh, the volunteers to be talented, to be professionals. No, we are asking the volunteers about their talents. Some people, they come with music talents, some people they come with art talents, and we try to build uh, up a project together for two and a half weeks. And this is a way how to encourage those children. So um, we have always team, uh, like um, a team of volunteers, international volunteers. Um, we are 
doing also different kinds of activities like work camps. We have the apple harvest, the almond harvest, the grape harvest, the fig harvest, and the olive, olive harvest. So international volunteers could come and join us to harvest the fruits there. And of course, it's a way to get to know the country, to meet people, and to understand the situation and go back home and believe there is hope for a better future. Um, the products, it's uh, difficult to, to um, sell on the farm, so uh, to sell on local markets because of the restrictions. That's why we try to process the products that the farm is producing, like olives, for olive oil. We do out of the grapes, grape syrup, and we try to sell those products on the farm. Like the idea is like, um, because all the products are organic products. You know. Now, um, we have international volunteers coming for short and long term to help with construction, with, with uh, agriculture. Um, we, we have exchange programs. We try to bring you know, uh, cultures and uh, young people from different nations together you know, to understand each other and build bridges. Uh, we have a women project in the village. My wife, she started this project for women in the village who do not have chances for education for many reasons. And the idea is to bring them out of their homes and um, bring them in touch with other women. They started with English, agricultural, computer classes. And the idea is um, to empower them. We have guest groups coming to visit the farm uh, for a talk, for a stay. 7,000 people came to visit us last year. And of course, imagine those 7,000 people they went back home with a message of hope. You know, because in a situation like that, it's very easy to get frustrated. But we want to show people, even in a difficult situation, we have to work together for a better future. We are trying our best in small steps you know, to think positively, um, uh, but also to be realistic. So not, you know, not to live in our dreams. Slowly, slowly, we can make a difference. But uh, our long-term goal is one day to, to build a school focusing on alternative energy, organic farming, and recycling, and to start this kind of education with children. And uh, we hope you know, one day to achieve this goal in small steps. We are trying, we are making the farm a symbol of peace and a sign of hope in a hopeless situation. Um, we are welcoming you. To, to join us, to think with us, to dream with us, and if you have some time also to come and join on the ground there. Um, very important thing to say here, like uh, the, the combination of the work we are doing is faith, love, and hope. If we have no faith, if we have no love, and we have no hope, we cannot achieve what we already achieved. And that's why we need to focus, like a farmer, using um, his, his donkey to plow, he's not allowed to look backwards. He should focus and uh, you know, look forward. We have a website, kindofnations.org. You can learn more about the work we are doing. And we started a couple of years ago with Friends of Tent of Nations. And my friend Bill and Beth are here. And uh, I don't know if they have the chance, but you can talk with them if you would like to get involved. Um, you can find more information about Fotona, um, fotonna.org. And I always say in small steps, slowly, slowly, you know, the journey for, and the struggle for justice will continue. Now, this is my son, Ishara. I have three children. I have two daughters, they are 15 and um, 12. And my son, Bishara, is 10 years old. And his name is Bishara, which means the good news. And sometimes it's very difficult to think about good news, but always when you hear even about conflicts, about Israel, Palestine, the conflict of religions or whatever, believe there are people who are trying to make a difference there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasser. Excellent presentation. Very sad story, very moving and disturbing. Actually, I wish this lecture was organized for campus-wide campus -wide 
uh, community where this would have been a big lecture, big, big lecture. I know the conflict. I myself grown up in a conflict situation. I teach world regional geography. The whole world is preoccupied with the conflict. This is one of the major one, which also affects the United States. You know, the, uh, 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 the issue of security, the issue of terrorism, the issue of Islamic fundamentalism, the, the Gulf War, you know, and by large, the result of radicalization of Islam has a lot to do with the mistreatment of Palestine. The whole thing, because it appeals, it appealed to us, it appealed to me here, I'm not even Palestinian. Imagine how this story is going to appeal to the Arab children. It's in easy, there's nothing more powerful than that. And our government, the US government has a big hand in that. And uh, I will just open it for uh, uh, some questions uh, for the students to ask. Actually, I show uh, a documentary, The Road to Palestine, uh, 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 narrated by uh, the British journalist, where the, 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 the old farmer was told to leave his farm to give away for the Russian Jews. So you, you will see that similar story. He has all the documents. He has all the deeds, all the, he paid all the taxes, and he said, this is not your place. And actually, you are lucky you are going through this you know, uh, battleground, and at the end, we don't know. But, but you know, the route you took is the most uh, important and very in holy and very uh, 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 human way. It takes time, there is no question about that especially when you are sandwiched between the two radicals. Mm. The Hamas, who think this project nonsense, because what they see every day, they, they do not really convince them to really take this, and also the, 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 the radical Jewish. It is a difficult project, actually. All right, uh, questions, comments, opinions, reflections. <coughs> Um, do you find uh, more people that are internationally involved than the people in your immediate community, or is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, like we have, uh, as I said before, we have all over a year we have international volunteers coming to help. Like some people, they come uh, during the planting season, you know, like between January and March. Some other people, they they come and participate in the summer camp with the children or on the women educational program. And in general, like we have uh, now six volunteers, two of them are from Germany and they are staying for a year. They come for a year to, you know, yeah. So we have always people there. And of course, international presence helped us a lot. Yeah. Question, opinion? You mentioned something about gray water. Can you explain what that is? Gray water? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, like, there um, on, on the farm, because we don't have, like, utilities, we don't have electricity, we are not connected with, um, uh, with sewage system and so on. We are not allowed. And the idea is, like, to make it difficult for us to exist, not to, you know, this is the plan. So, so what to do about the, the sewage water and about the gray water? So we, we, you know, we have like an under underground tank for that, but we try to process that and filter the water to be used at least for irrigation. And so this is what we are uh, trying to do, to have a full uh, cycle of water, because we cannot get water there, and we are limited in using, um, I mean, uh, we are depending on rainwater, and if we have no water there, we have to buy, and it's very expensive. So that's why we try, instead of watering all our trees from this system water, we try to filter the gray water and use for Yeah. You talked about like growing the different crops um, on the farm. Do you have to plant all of the different crops at the same time, or is it more of a rotating crop? Well, uh, mostly, you know, we are uh, we are planting trees because it's a dry dry area and sometimes we have like uh, you know we uh, grow like uh, wheat and so on 
but it depends on rain. You know, if we don't have enough rain, won't grow that much. So our focus mainly on trees. Uh, so the planting season is always any kind of tree is actually between January and March in the rainy season. Now, uh, some of the trees are producing uh, earlier than the other. For example, we have the apricot and the apple harvest in June. Now, uh, almond harvest in July. The grape harvest in August. And in September, we have the fig harvest. And end of October, we have the olive harvest. So, so almost like uh, starting in June, we're busy with harvesting fruits there. Yeah. Um, you next. Being in the area that you are, I was just wondering how connected or disconnected do you feel from the conflict between Hamas and Israel? Do you, are there people that try to draw you into that conflict more than you already are? Or are you trying to keep yourself out of the violence? Well, you know, like, uh, the thing is, uh, mostly the problems were also were in Gaza. You know, the thing is, you know, of course, like, we are in the West, but uh, living in a different a situation like this, everything is affected. You know? So uh, the, the, uh, the thing is, of course, we believe there is no solution with violence. Because you know? violence is creating more violence. And that's why we, we with this way of, of resistance, with this way of, um, of actions, we try to tell people, you know, anyone, you know, look, with, in, in a nonviolent way, in a constructive way, you are able to make a difference. Because until now, you know, like we as Palestinians, we always say the Israelis started and the Palestinians reacted. And the Israelis say, you know, the Palestinians started and, the, and, and we reacted. So it's, it's like who came first, the chicken or the, or the egg? And at the end, what is the outcome? Nothing. You know, that's why <clears throat> it's important to prove success there. It's important to, to show people that we are moving forward. It's a long way to go, but we are succeeding in a nonviolent way of resistance. You know? And we invite people to come and see. Some people, they might believe in our way of action. Some other people, they might say, oh, this is nonsense. But at the end, they realize there is no other way to solve this conflict um, with, you know, um, uh, just through understanding and through bringing people together. There is no way to solve the conflict with violence. The question I have, how much have you worked on attracting publicity from international media or some important individuals, especially from Scandinavia? Because this is extraordinary story, which should not, we should be told on, you know, on a global scale. Yes. What have you done? Any recognition? Any attention? Anything? Yes, we are of course trying to to inform people on different levels, you know, and especially this is something that our friends of the nations in the U.S. did and doing in informing uh, people, for example. After the destruction of our trees, many people reacted. Many people sent letters. You know, uh, we have also people coming from Europe and doing documentary films about the situation. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, it's important to to bring it on that level. You know, because we need to encourage people by doing that. You know, to show the other side of the story, but at the end, to show you know, even in a difficult in a, in a, in a you know very complicated situation, there are people who still think different. And this is what we are doing in terms of that. Okay. Last question there, okay. Well, I just uh, was wondering, like, since March, uh, that legal stuff happened, what's the, like, the status on the, like, the plantation or the area, like, in terms of, like, legal? Well, legally, you know, the, the Supreme Court, the, the High Court in Israel, demanded the military to respond why they destructed, why they destroyed the trees, you know. And of course, like, the military, military started to postpone. So they were given time until the 15th of September to give the reason. Because, you know, their, let us say, their claim at the beginning, they said, oh, we did it because it is a state land, and those people, they planted their trees not on their 
private land, but on state land. Now, we, we, brought, we brought our documents to the courts. So you look here, you know, this is our land, this is the land survey, these are the documents, so those trees were planted on private property. So that's why the Supreme Court demanded the military to respond. Okay, this is a private property, why did you destroy that? And of course, to, you know, let, let us say, uh, in order not to give any explanation, they start to postpone. So it is until the 15th of September, then they said we need an, another month until the 15th of October, and then they said another 15 days until the beginning of uh, November. We should, I mean, we should hear by today or tomorrow uh, if something happens, but I believe they will demand another month or two months, and this is the journey. It happens with us since 1991. All right, thank you very much, Nasser Bolo, and uh, I hope some of you learn a lot, and by that, not only uh, learning, but also be part of this his movement and influence. In the meantime, I want you to uh, uh, write one page reflection. Uh, you start with restating the problem, write a narration, and also the moral of the story and how it impacts, you know, the, 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 the peace movement. So Wednesday I need one page reflection on this lecture. Thank you so much. It would be interesting for me I to receive, you. yes, I please, yeah, to send me also your reflections. I will email it to you. Please, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>